Knowing how different lifting mechanisms work is fundamental to building effective robots. Today, we're looking at a common mechanism, the four bar lift. If you understand this, you're going to be able to design robots that can precisely control implements effectively, which will make your life a whole lot easier when ideating on how to design your next robot. I'm Brogan Pratt, and I've spent over a decade as an educator in robotics, design, and technology. I've seen countless robots, and I can tell you that a well-implemented four-bar lift is sometimes a game changer. So in this video, I'm going to run you through exactly how a four-bar lift functions. We'll start with some simple models to nail down the basic principles of some simple lifts, and then we'll look at how it's applied on the actual robot so you can see it in a more robust application and understand how it works. So if you use Lego Technic to describe this, you could think of this as the arm that's on top of the robot, and this is the actual arm that's rotating around. This would be a simple two-bar lift. You have one bar that's attached to the robot, and one bar that's actually rotating the object. Now imagine this green piece here is my claw. And if my claw stays in the same position, as I rotate this arm, you'll notice that the green gripper arm changes its angle as that rotation moves through. Especially if we're, trying, if we're trying to pick something up off the ground and place it at the same angle that we picked it up at, you can imagine a forklift. We actually want to be able to have this green arm rotate and stay parallel to the ground as we start. To solve that problem, engineers often turn to a standard four bar lift. So here a four bar lift is essentially a parallelogram. You have two parallel bars here and two parallel bars here. And as I lift and rotate that one arm around these two joints, you'll notice that all two bars, each set of bar stays parallel to each other. You can also pivot it this way, where you'll notice that each set stays parallel to each other. So you've got your base, you have your two arms that pivot from that base, and then that fourth link is the coupler, and that connects the ends of these two arms together. And because it is a parallelogram, as that lifts moves with that coupler link, where that grip would be attached, it stays parallel to the base. So let's go ahead and add our simple claw arm here to the end of our gripper, to that coupler, and you'll notice that as we lift ourselves up, that that gripper stays parallel to the ground the whole time. Another thing about having that second arm here is you'll notice that eventually the arms will hit into each other. So it does limit your reach in how far these arms are placed apart from each other at the start and the finish of that unit. So here in our chassis, we've got our four bar lift. In the universe system, we've got some little squishy wheels. So we can grab our piece, pick it up. And we can kind of lift it as if it were a claw. Now, just like on our small system, we have two parallel bars. I've got one parallel bar here and here. Even though this side is thinner, it is still a parallel bar system, and I have two parallel bar systems here. So as I move this list, you can see that this intake here, this little gripper, stays perfectly level or parallel. So if I were to pick something up, it's going to stay in that exact same orientation as I raise and as I lower it. It's really important in robotics because you can think of something like a forklift. You wouldn't want to lift something up and for it to change its angle as it were picking up as if it were in that two bar. You have to be able to lay something back flat as a server might carry you a drink to your tray or you might uh, go put something away on a shelf. You may also need to keep your sensors aimed correctly, whatever have you. Another thing to know about how I'm powering this lift is there's a bit of a complex system on the back here, but it's not as crazy as it looks. So on this system, down the bottom, I'm driving the whole thing off of a servo. This is a torque servo going from a 20 tooth into a 100 tooth gear, so I have a one to five reduction. Then a 16 tooth sprocket into a 32 sprocket for another reduction. Because this is such a long arm and I'm just driving this with a servo as opposed to a, a much more powerful DC motor, I need a lot more torque to be able to lift this system up. One thing to know about this whole bar as well is that as power goes through this gear system, through this sprocket into this sprocket, this section of the four bar lift here is powered. But the other side is simply running on an idler. It's not actually receiving any power instead. Instead, our coupler here is the one that's actually keeping these two bars moving together. So as this sprocket here rotates this arm that is clamped down, 
it pulls on the coupler. This then pulls on this arm, which then rotates at this back joint here in order for our arm to actually lift itself all the way up and all the way down. So some main reason you choose a four bar lift like this, obviously the first one is that constant orientation. You want to be able to have that piece moving at the moving in the same line all the time. It keeps that end effector stable and it keeps it predictable. If you're trying to stack things on, it makes it a lot uh, simpler to be able to stack things up. You also have a controlled path. Uh, you have a much wider arc than you do with a two bar lift as we showed earlier. But one of the big things is it's a little bit more complex to design than a simple two bar. You've got more pivoting points. You've got more things that couldn't work. Uh, right now, this is not actually the best system because I'm just, I just put on two uh, bolts here. So this whole thing is rotating on bolts instead. That's adding a lot of unnecessary friction to my system where I should be using a ball bearing system. But again, just to demonstrate the idea, this is more than good enough. Another big downside of four bar lift it's got a lot of weight. The longer that your arm gets, the heavier that your far end effector gets as well. And that makes it a little bit harder. And that makes it a little bit more challenging to design something around when you have something that's such a heavy lift. Like for instance, this lift here, when it's at its maximum weight, it can, if I were to give it a little bit of a tap, it can't support its own weight very well at all. So choose two bar lift, simpler, it's lighter, but your end effector is going to tilt as you were to lift yourself up. It's good for basic tasks where that orientation doesn't really matter. But that four bar lift, it's a lot more complex, but it gives you that crucial constant orientation, which is really helpful where you need to have a little bit more precision, a little bit more stability. So when you're building your four bar, make sure you pay attention to those pivot points here, as well as pivot points here. Use some good quality hardware. Don't just pivot on bolts. You're going to wear out your aluminum points uh, really fast there. And that's the core of how four bar lift works and why it's such a valuable mechanism when we're building robots. Starting with some of those simple models could really help you solidify those principles before you actually go and build that real thing. Because if you mess up on this build, building something out of smaller models, cardboard makes a lot faster. And what's really cool is now that you understand how four bars lift, you're going to start seeing these everywhere in real life. Four bar lifts is a super common linkage as designed in regular life. If you found value in the video and you've learned something new, consider dropping a like and subscribe for more content on robotics concepts, programming, and design. And best of luck in your next robotics project.